John Reed, Euro Dinosaur. It was a nice day today, so I decided to uh, do our introduction out here in the Garden of Eden uh, before the weather gets bad. This is a video on DC-6 cargo operations out of Miami, Florida that my company Regulus Productions released in VHS videotape format on January 2nd, 1992. The title was DC-6 West Indies Odyssey and it was an instant, instant success in relative terms. There was no such thing as going viral back then. Despite that, we sold over a thousand copies worldwide for $39.95 per copy. And today, any aviation-based uh, video sharing channel would be hard-pressed to gross that kind of money on a single video, if anything at all. The informational and experience arbitrage opportunities that existed 30 years ago has all but evaporated in today's social media age. We advertise through magazines such as Air Classics, Airliners, and Air Progress. Air Classics is the only of these publications that survives today, and their loyal readers will no longer see any advertisements for videos in most issues. Uh, back in the day, each issue carried up to a dozen or more aviation video display ads. The DC-6 operator in this video was Transair Link Corporation, or TAL, operating out of the northwest corner of Miami International Airport, which was often referred to as Corrosion Corner, a place that has long since passed into history. I learned of TAL during the mid-1980s as their DC-6 and DC-7C prop liner cargo operations were regularly covered in articles and photos in periodicals such as Stephen Piercy's Prop Liner magazine. There were a lot of pictures and articles available then on TAL and this topic, but even by 1991 there was still no meaningful nor comprehensive video coverage as consumer video technology was in its infancy at that time and not widespread. I decided to change that and, and TAL was eager to cooperate. Prior to the release of DC-6 West Indies Odyssey in 1992, I'd already written and published PropLiner articles and previously re released a successful first video along, similar, along a similar format called Flight of the Super Constellation. This was based on Savakani's restored L1049H Star of America. For my article and later videos, including this one, I owe my deepest gratitude to the late John Wegg, founder and former editor of Airliners and Airways magazines, and the late Harry Gann, director of information and historian at Douglas Aircraft in Long Beach, for their enthusiastic support of an unproven novice like me. 
I also owe gratitude to the now defunct World Transport Press out of Miami, aviation media wholesaler and publisher of Airliners Magazine, who sold all Regulus Productions videos worldwide. It was July 1991 when I decided I wanted to produce prop liner videos beyond Flight of the Super Constellation. I wrote a letter to TAL. There was no email then. And within a week, I received this very positive response letter from its founder and president, Gary Balnicki, with one caveat. The caveat revolved around the overall seedy reputation of operators out of Corrosion Corner as operational and maintenance corner cutters and illegal drug and arms runners. Given TAL's impeccable straight shooter reputation at the corner, Balnicki's only concern was that I might be a typical sensational journalist wanting to frame TAL as one of these illicit operators. While drugs, arms, and stowaways had been sneaked onto TAL flights by traffickers in the past, these were concealed inside cargoes such as fish and animal carcasses, as well as inside wheel wells, etc. TAL as a Part 121 airline was never a complicit smuggler or trafficker. As one Air America C-123 pilot in Southeast Asia is purported to have said, we just checked the cargo manifests and flew the planes. We didn't look inside the boxes. While DC-6 West Indies Odyssey didn't necessarily represent the pinnacle of professional videography, we covered a topic that had never been covered in such detail. And TAL and our customers were very happy with our work. Actually, TAL bought quite a few copies of DC-6 West Indies Odyssey at cost to send to their customers throughout the Caribbean and Latin America as a promotional. On top of that, McDonnell Douglas Long Beach had a department that worked very closely with reputable operators of its very obsolete aircraft, including TAL and its Douglas prop liners. Long Beach actually ordered several copies of DC-6 West Indies Odyssey for general overview training for that department. Well, enough said. Let's go back in time to September 1991 for a DC-6 West Indies Odyssey. This is Miami, international melting pot, gateway to trade in Latin America and the Caribbean. For many island communities, the airways are the only practical link to civilization. No interstate highways, no railroads, period. From outward appearances, we're in an affluent age of technical wonder. But what is being used on the Caribbean Skyway? Ironically, you won't find smart competitors drooling over the multi-million dollar digitized wide body. Down here, shippers, forwarders, and even major airlines still look to the 45-year-old Douglas DC-6, a low-tech, fully depreciated piston dinosaur. Out of 700 built between 1946 and 1958 for majors such as American, Delta, Sabina, and United, a residual few thrive today in Miami as freighters with independent operators. Some are former C-118 military transports. As the most significant post-war medium to long-range propeller airliner, the DC-6 has a nominal range of 3,800 miles. It is easy to see why this vintage heavy iron is more useful than ever with its 26,000 pound cargo capacity. 
to summarize, on the American highway, one hires a truck. On a Caribbean skyway, one hires a sky truck. One of Miami's most renowned sky truck operators is Trans Air Link Corporation, or TAL. They're a certificated, unrestricted Part 121 carrier utilizing three DC-6s and the world's only Douglas DC-7 that still meets and exceeds Part 121 standards. This extremely rare DC-7CF can carry 33% more cargo than the DC-6. Though its temperamental right R3350 turbo compounds require greater maintenance, the DC-7 is a splendid performer and valuable asset. Operating from this modest headquarters building on the northwest corner of Miami International, TAL flies scheduled DC-6 air freight to St. Martin, St. Croix, St. Thomas, and Puerto Rico. The company also flies regular charters to Antigua, Jamaica, Bahamas, Cayman Islands, Costa Rica, and Mexico. Since its founding in 1981, TAL's meticulously maintained vintage propeller transports have seen worldwide destinations. Cargo can be just about anything, from industrial equipment to horses, pigs, and chickens, from furniture to carpet to appliances and truck tires, anything the isolated island communities need to survive. This includes hazardous cargo not allowed on commercial passenger flights. Backhauls are often shipments from U.S. factories located in the Caribbean. Right now, we're loading a DC-6, which is scheduled for a 1 p.m. departure to Freeport, Bahamas. Flight engineer Edgar Badeo introduces the captain and first officer on this mission. And here's the rest of the crew, captain. Yeah, I'm Captain Roberto Amador. We're going to Freeport today and uh, uh, wait for takeoff to be around 80,000 pounds. It's going to be a short flight uh, from here to Freeport about uh, one hour. And uh, here is our uh, first officer, uh, Gonzo. Hi, I'm uh, William Gonzalez, Bill, Bill Gonzo. And I'm the first officer on this flight. Uh, we got all the paperwork ready. The cargo is ready and we're ready to go. In listening to this modest crew, routine certainly seems to be the rule, not the exception. However, the aeronautical backgrounds of pilots Amador and Gonzalez have been anything but routine. Each put in plenty of overtime defending his respective homeland, Nicaragua and Cuba, from communist-style oppression. Their combined logbooks of life include jungle survival after being shot down courtesy of a SAM missile, years of imprisonment, and even aerial escapes to freedom.
But wait, we have preparations to make because we've been assigned a flight. Our schedule is much more strenuous than the Freeport trip. Tomorrow we fly the scheduled run down to the West Indies, logging a total of 13 flight hours on this DC-6A-870 Tango Alpha. We will not operate at convenient times for our sleep schedule because freight does not sleep. Our first destination will be St. Martin, which is 1,000 nautical miles to the southeast, with arrival at 8.30 a.m. St. Martin time. To meet that, we have a scheduled departure of 2 a.m. tomorrow morning. After cargo transfer at St. Martin, our grueling day has only begun. All day long, we'll be hopping islands, loading, unloading, and fueling. From St. Martin, we fly to St. Croix, St. Thomas, then to San Juan by late afternoon. We'll then depart for Barrancan on the west coast of Puerto Rico for a welcome layover. But the following morning, we arise at 2.30 a.m. for a 4 a.m. departure with full load back to Miami, a routine trip for any air freight crewman. Our aircraft emerged from the Douglas Santa Monica plant in 1957. First earmarked for slick airways, it was instead delivered to the Belgian Air Force, where it spent most of its life flying both passengers and freight. Before coming to TAL in 1985, it flew with Venezuelan operators. Zero Tango Alpha is a medium-time airframe, which will pass through 22,600 hours of operation on this trip. The stretch DC-6A superseded the basic DC-6 and was normally produced as a freighter. The DC-6B was the more common passenger variant. Our night takeoff over the ocean void will be at full payload and maximum gross weight. The outbound cargo is the usual mix of unpredictable shipments, including aluminum extrusions, live tropical fish, refrigerators and appliances, electric motors, fresh seafood, and even a menacing Rottweiler dog, appropriately caged, of course. The DC-6 is powered by four ancient Pratt & Whitney R2800 double WASP radials, developing 2,400 horsepower each on takeoff using water alcohol injection. Water alcohol is necessarily introduced to the atomized fuel mixture during heavy takeoffs to keep the engines from overheating during temporary overboost. This output allows our DC-6 to take off with 26,000 pounds of freight and 3,000 gallons of fuel for a maximum gross takeoff weight of 103,800 pounds. With more nominal loads, the DC-6A typically climbs at 500 feet per minute. But in the morning, at full gross, our laboring sky truck will initially climb at only 200 feet per minute. Big piston airliners were never cherished for their fully loaded climbing abilities. Transairlink's Director of Quality Control, Bill Wynn, cannot understand why the U.S. mainland is shipping live tropical fish down live to the island. Live tropical fish, one plate, but that's where they come from. But yet here we are, transporting live fish back to St. Martin. Tomorrow's air crew is highly seasoned. Captain Joel Reeves is retired Air Force, as is flight engineer Gino Gentili. First officer Edgar Alvarado has a wealth of commercial heavy piston experience behind him. Surprisingly, few of these crewmen have any interest in flying jets, truly preferring their association with the rare vintage props. For voice communication with the ground control units, it would be VHF 1 or 2, one or the other, not both. Uh, for long range uh, voice transmission, uh, in our case, to Houston, Texas, for flight following purposes, it'll be high frequency one selected if you wish to monitor. Bill if Wynn explains to, how to monitor uh, the communications monitor frequencies. The Houston radio flight. will monitor our flight. Ten hours later, we're packed to the roof. Pre-flight complete, weight and balance calculated, cargo documents in order, flight plan filed. Captain Reeves says weather is calm along our ocean track, Amber 555. Engineer Gentili fires up the radials.
Engineer Gentile carefully runs up each engine, first to 1,700 RPM for blade check, then up to field barometric pressure for magneto check. Over the next 24 hours, we have five more takeoffs in addition to this one. Besides, we've had no sleep, so let's just get airborne and try and catch a little shut-eye while our crew goes about its business. Okay, we're rolling. At speed V1, Gentilly advances throttles to the takeoff gate. Okay, let's forget to sleep. This fully loaded thing is climbing at only 200 feet per minute. Routine maybe, but the Miami buildings are getting closer and we don't seem to be getting any higher. Thankfully, only an illusion. We reduce to climb power. We're now well over the ocean as Captain Reeves keys in backup navigation. Still groping for our 9,000 foot cruise altitude, climb airspeed is 155 knots indicated. At cruise, we will trim out to 190. The first glimmer of sunlight is finally upon us. It's 8.15 a.m. and we're cleared for the straight in on the east runway at St. Martin. Winds are from the east at 15. On our five and a half hour jaunt, we will have burned 2,200 gallons of fuel. So we're roughly 13,000 pounds lighter than we were at takeoff. Here at St. Martin, we'll be offloading 22,000 pounds of cargo. With 800 gallons of fuel remaining for our short jump to St. Croix, we should have a new takeoff weight of only 69,000 pounds. Our vicious friend was a good passenger after all. Good puppy. But there is a catch, as is often the case in the freight business. We've just been intercepted by 17,000 pounds of heavy fabric from the Netherlands bound for St. Croix. The two pallets arrived via jumbo jet and are too large for the DC-6. 
Each will therefore have to be broken down by hand before loading. At the very minimum, there'll be a two-hour delay. While we're waiting, let's see what's going on back at Miami. Maintaining ancient piston aircraft to Part 121 standards is very labor-intensive. Dedicated maintenance engineers make up a large proportion of TAL's Miami workforce. Truly, it has to be that way, as the old radial reciprocators require considerably more daily attention than the modern turbofan. In fact, the 2,400 horsepower Pratt & Whitney R2800 double wasp easily ranks among the most complex pieces of piston machinery ever designed but also one of the most reliable when properly maintained. This 2,800 cubic inch air-cooled monster is an archaic array of reciprocating and revolving parts with 18 cylinders, pistons, intake, and exhaust valves, two master and 16 articulated connecting rods, one dual magneto, two distributors, 18 transformer coils, and 36 spark plugs, tappets, push rods, and rocker arms. The oil lubrication and auxiliary systems are so complex we can't even begin to describe them. The gear-driven blower is housed behind the crankshaft between the carburetor and manifold. This pinwheel-shaped supercharger pressurizes the manifold in order that rated horsepowers be achieved. In the nose section is the planetary reduction gearing to the propeller, which reduces prop RPM by about one half. Propeller blade pitch is hydraulically regulated with engine oil in accordance with the prop governor setting for each flight phase. The engine has a very colorful history. Designed just prior to World War II as a fighter engine, the R2800 powered some well-known single engine fighters such as the Vought F4U Corsair, Republic P47 Thunderbolt, and Grumman F8F Bearcat. The advanced C-Series R2800 design used on the DC-6 powered a wide range of post-war airliners and military transports. Douglas made the DC-6A and B available with either the CB-16 or 17 variants of the R2800. These both utilize two-speed blowers with high blower enabling moderate cruise altitudes of just over 20,000 feet using high-octane 115-145 avgas. This fuel grade is no longer available. Only grade 100 is produced. As a result, TAL uses engines converted to CB3 standards with deactivated high blower. This limits service ceiling to under 15,000 feet. However, because the cabin pressurization has also been deactivated, these planes rarely cruise above 10,000 feet. At a new gross weight of 86,000 pounds, or 17,000 pounds heavier than anticipated on our 25-minute flight to St. Croix because of all that fabric in back. Water alcohol and a sharp bank to the right will be necessary to avoid the hill at the end of the runway. Takeoff flap setting is 20 degrees. For takeoff roll, throttles are advanced to 53 inches at 2800 RPM. 
at V1, the engineer commits the throttles to 59.5 inches, activating the water alcohol. V2 is liftoff speed. Shortly thereafter, landing gear is raised and power reduced to Mido at 48.5 inches and 2600 RPM, where the water alcohol is turned off. As airspeed increases through 140 knots indicated, flaps are raised and power is reduced to climb at 38 inches and 2400 RPM for a 155 knot climb. Watch out for that hill. A few gallons of sweat later, we make it over the hill, albeit a little lower than usual. We cruise at only 1,500 feet on a southwesterly heading. Cruise power varies. For a heavy load, it's 34 inches and 2,200 RPM. For a light load, perhaps 32.5 inches and 2,000 RPM. We now parallel the southern shore of St. Croix on a right downwind for runway 9. Winds from the east at 20. Prop RPM settings for landing vary with conditions ranging between 2,000 and 2,400 RPM. Landing gear is lowered and the captain calls for flap settings as needed. On short final, setting is full down at 50 degrees with 110 knots indicated over the threshold. hours late. Just as the loading of the fabric delayed us at St. Martin, its unloading will likewise delay us here. Most all of our other freight will be offloaded here, including those live tropical fish. No new cargo will be taken on. However, we do take on just enough fuel to legalize the next two legs to San Juan, where we'll take on full fuel for tomorrow's return trip to Miami. Flight engineer Gentile cross-checks the fuel gauges with the most accurate and reliable fuel monitoring device known to man, the measuring stick. This is mandatory before and after each flight. <laughs> 